How are you this morning? Oh, let me try that again. I said, how are you this morning? That's a little bit better, but you still ain't got it. I said, how are you this morning? There you go. That's my church. Well, let's, uh, let's just pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. How many of you believe God has a word for you today? I never come to church without expecting a word from God. So, Father, I just thank you right now. That you give us an opportunity to receive from your word. God, I pray that you would put me on like a coat and wear me today, Jesus. Let me speak an oracle of you. Let me speak into the hearts of men and women, whether they're live in this room, live on, on campus, or live online, or watching later. I thank you, God, that you've given me a word that can transform their life in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. Amen. Well, we are really excited about our brand new series called Stories. Everybody say stories. So, so what is this all about? What's the whole stories thing? You can see it's kind of the Instagram or Insta stories theme that we're going with. And we're looking at some amazing stories that Jesus told. But, but if you put a story on Instagram, it goes away in 24 hours. These stories are timeless. These stories have lasted throughout history. And so we're looking at this great tool that Jesus used to communicate kingdom and kingdom life during his ministry, and they're called parables. Now, most of us, whether we've been to church or not, we've heard of parables. Matter of fact, William Barclay said it this way on the parables of Jesus. He said, even in an age when men know less and less of the Bible and care less for it, it remains true that the stories Jesus told are the best-known stories in the world. Now, you might say, okay, well, what are these things? What is a parable? Well, some people would say they're an, a, an allegory or an analogy. Some might say they're fables like Aesop, which they're really not. But, but they, they certainly can be allegories, they can be analogies, but they're really much more than that. In essence, and you may have seen on the definition in the bumper video, said that a parable is a simple story that conveys a spiritual, or we would say a kingdom truth. Or you could say it this way, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Meaning, Jesus loved parables. He loved them so much that in most definitions that you look up in most dictionaries, it's going to say something about the parables Jesus told and the teachings of Jesus. It says in Matthew that Jesus never talked to the crowds. Not one time did he ever preach to a crowd that he didn't use a parable. So how many of you think Jesus loved parables? Now, why did he love them so much? Well, there could be several reasons. One is, could be historical because back in the day when people couldn't read, they, the way they, they taught truth was to, through stories. The way you passed down history was through stories. The way the children of Israel told about what all God did for them was through stories. So, so it was a, a common method used to communicate any kind of a truth, but Jesus takes it a little bit further. The Greeks now, they love to, to tell stories, but they wanted to argue and debate. They were going to debate with you, and they didn't care what conclusion we came to. They didn't care. They just wanted to debate. Sounds like your news feed on Facebook right now. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of all the debates. I'm tired of scrolling through Facebook and seeing everybody. Nobody's convincing anybody of anything. They're just spewing their, their stuff, and, and that's kind of what the Greeks did. But the Hebrews had a different view. They thought we want to, rather than just debate, we want to dialogue, and we want to come to a conclusion. But watch this. Once the conclusion comes, 
it demands a response. So whenever the Hebrews would, would, would have any kind of a story time, they wanted the story to teach them a truth. Then once they learned the truth, it demanded a response. As a matter of fact, some of you may have heard or read in the Gospels where Jesus would say, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear. The Passion says it this way. It says, in light of this truth, what must we now do? So that was a Hebrew mindset. Once we come to the truth, it's demanding that we do something. So parables confront us with truth that calls us to action. Another thing that parables, and maybe a reason Jesus loved them, was because they bring an awakening. They persuade men to pass judgment on things which are well acquainted with a story that really fits into their world and their narrative and then transfer that judgment to something whose significance they've been blind to. So maybe if you're a teacher, you've seen this or used this tool. I've used it in pastoring many times. You're trying to help somebody see something and they just can't see it. You tell them a story and they go, oh, that's not good. And then all of a sudden, you say, yeah, that applies here, and they get it. The penny drops, the light bulb goes off, and all of a sudden, they understand what you're trying to say. Uh, you can see that in the life of David, who had done terrible stuff. He had committed adultery, he had uh, lied about it, he had cheated, he had been a peeping Tom, he had killed uh, the, the woman, Bathsheba's husband, he had her killed so he could take her as his wife. But David deep down loved God. He just had a blind spot. And so the prophet comes to him and says, tells him this story about a guy who had one little sheep. And this other guy had all these sheep. And he stole this one guy's sheep and then killed it. And, and the, the, the guy, David says, that's terrible. Who did that? Tell me who that is and I'm going to get him. And the prophet looked at him and said, it's you. And at that moment, he realized that parable, that story gripped his heart. So Jesus did that. Another thing is Jesus wanted to use a picture of natural things to explain supernatural principles. An earthly story, remember we said, that has a heavenly meaning. So Jesus used earthly things to lead men's minds toward heavenly Things. It was a way, if you will, for heaven and earth to collide. Jesus was coming, announcing this new kingdom, this new way of living, this new way of thinking. And they were never going to understand it because it was exactly 180 degrees diametrically opposed to everything they had been taught. And so Jesus said, I'm going to use these stories to help you get it. Now, we've been talking this year about how this is a season or a year of suddenlies. Everybody say suddenly. Come on, say that with me. Say suddenly. But one category of suddenlies is sudden revelation. So we talked about suddenlies are going to come in lots of different ways. One is sudden revelation. And this is what Jesus did. He used parables to bring sudden revelation where heaven and king, the kingdom of heaven collided with the kingdom of or the ways of this earth. So parables kind of come chronologically, and in that chronology, you can learn something about them. First of all, the first group of parables are about how we should think. He's introducing a new narrative, a world that's upside down to everything they know, and so he's teaching them how to think. The second ones are teaching them how to live, and then the third ones are teaching them what's next, the judgment and, the, and rewards, and at the end of the age, what else is coming. Now, you may say, well, how many parables are there? Well, uh, it depends on, on who you talk to and how they want to classify what's a parable and what's an allegory and what's an analogy. But there's somewhere between 35 and 40 of these parables. Most of them are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, there, there are a few in other places. Now, we're not going to look at all 35 or 45 of those, or this would be a really long series. So we're going to take just a few of them, okay? And what I want to ask you to do is maybe over the next few weeks, in your devotional time, what if you begin to look up other parables and ask God to show you some stuff about each one of these parables? Because parables cause us to, to listen, to learn, and then to respond or to take action. To listen, 
to learn and then to take action. So, so that's what these parables are. we're going to do throughout these few weeks. We're going to listen, we're going to learn, and then we're going to take action. Come on, let's say that together because I want us to get that in our heart and in our mind. We're going to listen. Come on, say listen, learn, take action. Let's say it again. Listen, learn, take action. So that's what we're going to do. So you ready to get started? All right, I'm going to do this quickly. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And I'm going to kind of set the stage, and then we're going to pick up. This is kind of a transitional parable between the how to think and how to act in these these. We're going to look at two of them about seeds. Now, in the beginning of this chapter, it says that the crowd is so big that Jesus needed to back away from them to be able to preach to them, so he borrowed a boat. I don't know if it's a big boat or a small boat, but in my mind, it's a small boat. Probably because I went to Sunday school, and all they could put on the flannel graph when I was a kid was a small boat. So in my mind, it's a small boat. So they moved this little small boat, and Jesus is standing up in the boat, and he's preaching to the crowd. And in the backdrop, can you imagine with me, there's farmers everywhere. There's farms. That, this is an agricultural society. So although they live, in, or, or they're standing, excuse me, the setting is by the beach, they're living in an agricultural world, and Jesus thinks, I want them to learn something. And so I, what can I use? And he sees a farm, and he starts telling a story. There was a farmer who had some seed, and he scattered it. Everywhere. See, that's what parables do. They, 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 you've got something you want to convey, and you take something natural, and you say it. And he then goes on, and he, he says, this farmer sowed seed, and there were three kinds of soil. First of all, he says, some of the seed fell by the wayside or on a path. Now, that doesn't mean much to you, but to us, by their fields, when they would have a, a agricultural a crop, they would make rows where people could walk so they wouldn't tread on their harvest. So these footpaths were worn places that they cut out for them to walk on, like a sidewalk we would have now. And, and he said, some of it fell on these footpaths, and birds came and snatched them up and stole them. Then he goes on and he says some went to another uh, area, that, that some of it went to this place called rocky places. Now, now we think of gravel, but it was, this wasn't gravel. They're rocky places, and they would have known exactly what Jesus meant. They had a small, like maybe two inches of topsoil and then hard rock underneath it. I mean a slab of rock, like limestone, that would go over a huge period. So, so he said, in this instance, the, the, they would sow the, the sower sowed the seed, and the seed immediately sprouted up quickly, but it had no root. The rock was so thick and so strong it couldn't build roots. And so the sun came and it scorched it up and, and ruined it. And then he goes on and he says that there was a, a third type of soil that seeds were sown into. It was sown and there were thorns and weeds. And how many of you know weeds grow faster than what you want, whatever else you planted, weeds grow faster. And so he said the thorns and the weeds grew up and they choked it out and suffocated it and and it didn't last. He said, but then there was some good soil and it landed on that good soil and it produced 30, 60 or 100 fold return or harvest. And so when he's finished telling this story, everybody loved Jesus' stories. He goes to them in, in, in verse 10 and 11. They, they, in verse 10, they said, why do you speak these parables? What are you doing, Jesus? What is happening? You've got this whole crowd of people. You're, tw- you're, you're, you're trending on Twitter. And, 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 and you, you, people are flocking to you. And you're telling stories about seeds. What are you doing? And so in verse 11, Jesus tells them exactly what he's doing. He said, because, he answered them and said to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but not to them has it been given. Verse 12, for whosoever has to him will be given more, 
and he will have an abundance. But whosoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables. So obviously Jesus had come out of the boat, maybe took a coffee break. And, and so they're talking to him before he's going to go back. And teach some more. And he said that I teach them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear and, and they do not understand. Verse 15. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have been closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears, for they hear. So Jesus said, I'm preaching to them in parables because they don't really get what you're going to get. And he said, I'm going to explain the parables to you in private, and they're not going to understand it. Do you know that tells me that you can have a crowd of thousands of people, and they can be saying amen, raising their hands, acting like they're worshiping God. They can be shouting. They can be doing all kinds of things, but they don't really hear. Because there's hearing, and then there's hearing. There's seeing, and then there's seeing. And so I don't know about you, but I want to be a person who doesn't just hear. I want to get it. And so that's why every week I pray, God, open our ears to hear. Open our eyes to see. Open our heart to receive. And I pray, God, give me entrance into the hearts of men and women, whether they're on campus or online. Because God, watch this, has something he wants to put in your life, but you got to have ears to hear it. And so then Jesus says, okay, verse 18, he says, let me listen then to what this parable of the sower means. He said, they don't get it, you get it, so, so I'm going to help you get it. So he's saying, listen, learn, and apply. And then verse 19, he said, when anyone hears this message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart this is the seed sown on the path. So the first thing we see is the seed is God's word or God's promise over your life. So seed equals word. Everybody say that with me. Seed. Come on, say it again. Okay, so the seed is the word of God. The word of the kingdom. Everything in the kingdom begins as a seed. God's word in our life is a seed. But then the soil, he's saying, is the heart. So he, he's saying that God is going around sowing seeds. He's sowing opportunities. But there's different types of soil or different conditions of your heart. And depending on the condition of your heart will determine if the seed produces any fruit. So the first soil, he says, is the path or that footpath or the wayside that we talked about. And he said, birds come and the seed gets snatched. So the first type of soil happens when the seed gets snatched. And he said, these people don't understand it. You know, there's a lot of people that come to church and they hear the word, but they don't understand it. And sometimes they don't understand it because they get distracted. And when they get distracted, birds come and snatch it up. Has anybody ever been to the beach? Five people have been to the beach. Come on, have you been to the beach? Has anybody ever got food out at the beach? And seagulls come and they swoop down and they snatch up your food. Have you ever just had, they just come and snatch it? Just come and they're just snatching it. Now I don't know whose phone is whose. But they snatch up your food, pass those back out appropriately, or take whichever one you want, I guess. They snatch up your food and they eat it and devour it 
right in front of you. Do you know some people come to church and before they can ever get out the door, the devil comes like a bird and snatches that word right out of their life. And God is throwing a promise at them, a promise of salvation, a promise of healing, a promise of blessing, a promise to change their life, a promise of freedom, a promise of peace, a promise of joy. And before they can walk out the door, the devil snatches. He said, birds come. I think Jesus was in the 21st century because I've seen some birds that came. I think I have a picture of one. Some angry birds come and snatch in the word of God. You know, there's just a bunch of angry birds in life. And they're just trying to come snatch the stuff right out of your life. There's another bird. I've got another bird in this century that... Maybe comes and snatches some things. That Twitter bird, whatever he's called. The Bible says the devil, the thief, comes to steal, to kill and destroy. So you could say it this way. He wants to swipe your seed. He wants to swipe your seed. Some of you, God's trying to give you promises and the devil's swiping. Some of you right now, you got bored with my message and you're swiping. I'm trying to plant the seed of God's word in your life to save you, to heal you, to change you, to turn your life around, to get rid of your depression, to save you from all the mess you've been in. And you're swiping, swiping, swiping. Sometimes God gives you a promise and and listen, you start scrolling, you start swiping, 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 and you're looking and you're comparing. You started out, you were excited about your promise, but then you compared your little promise to somebody else's what seems to be a bigger promise, and at first you were excited God gave you five dollars to buy a Starbucks because somebody in front of you bought you a, a, a Starbucks and you got a free Starbucks, but then you started swiping, and while you were swiping, you saw somebody else got a new car, and you said, screw the Starbucks. I want a new car. Come on, are you here? Some of you signed up to go to youth camp and you worked and you mowed lawns and you did. And God provided. And you were so, and then you started swiping. Somebody said, I didn't do anything. Somebody paid my camp. And you said, forget it. Because the devil snatched it from you. Come on, are you here? Some of you are swiping this way. You're scrolling through and you're comparing your low lights to somebody else's highlights. They're not telling you everything. Don't ever believe most of what you read. Or at least know there's more to the story. But some of you, some of you swapping this way, some of you swapping this way. Some of you swapping this way. Some of you don't know the difference, but some of you that are laughing do. Because some of you, you, you made a commitment. You're going to live for Jesus. You're not going to let that guy, you, you're not going to missionary date no more. You're not going to date some knucklehead that's trying to get your pants off every time you go out on a date. And then all of a sudden you swipe. <laughs> I'm preaching now. And you go, well, maybe just this one time. Look at him. He's so fine. You got to get rid of the birds. You got to get rid of the distractions. Do you know the French had, had lots of ways to torture people? One way they would torture you to kill you was by distraction, they called it. It's where they would take four, your four limbs and tie them to a rope and pull in four different directions until your limbs came apart. It was called death by distraction. Some people can't live out the promise of God because they're living in death by distraction. The enemy's too busy distracting them. Social media is great. But don't let it swipe your seed. 
Some of you, see, that's the thing. I don't know whether you're taking notes, tweeting. Some of you are posting what I'm saying on your Insta story. That's great. Do that. It's awesome. But some of you, while you're doing that, then you keep, keep swiping. And God's about to give you a prophetic word that will change your life. And you're, you're looking at somebody else's lunch. It's such an important thing to know what somebody you haven't seen in 20 years in high school had for lunch last Tuesday. It's critical to the kingdom and to your well-being. Hallelujah. I'm not being hard. I just don't want to see your seed get snatched up. Second thing, verse 20, then he goes on to say the second type of soil is seed falling on rocky ground. Remember, that's that thin layer of topsoil with rock under, a bedrock underneath. It refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Verse 21, but since they have no root, they last just a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word's sake, they quickly fall away. So this is a person that comes to church and pastor's preaching and they get all excited. Oh my Lord, I, I'm so excited. They, they, they waving the hanky, bucking the weave out the head. They having a great time. And then all of a sudden, they walk out the door and somebody cuts them off, pulling out the parking lot. They're throwing the universal sign. Talk about birds. They're flipping birds everywhere. Angry birds going everywhere. They're cussing with hashtags and expletives everywhere. And they forgot. They've done lost the joy that they had for a moment. They only last a minute. Listen, God is looking for some people who can live longer than 30 seconds obeying God. And you don't just wave your hanky on a Sunday morning on Monday afternoon when you're at work, when people are persecuting you, when you're still rejoicing. See, it says that, it says that, that, that uh, they had no root in them. They got excited for a minute. Then they had no root in them. Where do you get roots? The Bible says those that are planted in the house of God flourish in the courts of their Father. So if you plant in the church in God's house you'll you'll grow and you'll bear fruit some people can't bear fruit because they pull up their roots some people are pulling their roots up so fast that they can't get down to anything that matters he says they have no root in them and so the sun comes and their seed gets scorched, scorched. It's interesting that they're scorched because they don't have roots. So when the sun comes, they get dry and it burns them up. Some people, and it says, it says this, they get persecuted for, when trouble or persecution comes for the word's sake. Do you know some trouble that comes into your life is because God has a promise over you? Let me say that again. I said some trouble that comes in your life is because you have a promise over your life. Listen, if the devil ain't messing with you, maybe you, you ain't doing nothing. But as soon as God speaks a promise over your life, don't be surprised that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he comes to scorch that seed. And, and then some people, they, they, get, they get all excited. They get born again. They come to church. Things are going great. They're doing something great for God. Then they go home, and their friends make fun of them. Or they don't, they don't cheat at work. They won't lie, and their boss fires them. So they get a new morality. Or, 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 or a girl says, I'm not... I'm not going to sleep around anymore. I'm not going to do that. And, and I'm telling my boyfriend, we're not doing that. We're, we're, we're cutting that. We're stopping that till we get married. We're going to wait. And then he makes fun of her. Persecutes her. I could go on and on, whatever the, the analogies are for you. But watch this. Don't be surprised when trouble comes or persecution comes when you try to live by kingdom 
values. Some people are crying about their persecution. Understand, you might be doing something right. See, sometimes I'm waiting to get watered. I'm waiting for my seed to be watered from the rain of man's approval. But if I have some roots, it'll go down into a well that's so deep. I don't need your approval. My roots tap into a well that's deeper than anything on the outside. So some seeds get scorched. We want to go deep so that doesn't happen. Then in verse 22, he says, There's seed, the seed that was falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life or the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke, or one translation says strangles, or one, and the people's, or excuse me, the Passion Translation says suffocates the word and making it unfruitful. So this soil in this soil environment, the seed is strangled. It's strangled. Strangled by what? The worries of this life. Notice it doesn't say the responsibilities of this life. Your responsibilities will never kill your seed. Only worrying about your responsibilities will kill your seed. Your worry about how you're going to pay your bills is the thing that's going to destroy or kill the seed that God's trying to plant in you, not actually all the stuff you've got to do. You could say it this way, worry strangles your seed, but worship strengthens your seed. So don't worry, worship. See, worry, worry comes and it just starts choking the life out of you. And it just keeps squeezing until you can't breathe. And that promise needs air, but it's choking, it's suffocating, strangling. But as you begin to worship, all that worry leaves, and you can begin to breathe again. That's why you'll never catch me coming up in here late, because I want to get in the presence of God. And I want to breathe so that when God deposits seed of his word in me in the preaching, my heart is filled with worship, not with worry. He says the worries of this life, the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of wealth and riches. Now, some of you go, oh, good, I can check out now because I ain't got enough money to worry about that. So that's for them other folks who got big, fat bank accounts. But you notice he didn't say worry and wealth. He said the deceitfulness of wealth. So there's a deception that wealth can bring. And it can be, that can be the case if you have lots of money. That can be the case if you have no money. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you can love money and be dead broke. I've seen people who had no money that loved money more than people who had a lot of money. Some of the people that I know that have a lot of money have a lot of money because they were generous and they're givers and they give it all away and they're not worried about it and they don't worry about money and they don't worry about that stuff, but they didn't worry about it when they didn't have money, so when they have money, they still don't worry about it. But if I, if I am a kind of person that's been deceived into thinking that money equals security, then I'm in trouble. So he said, he said this, this one, when, when, when this thing happens, then what is happening is your seed is being strangled. It's being strangled. God may tell you to, to go on a missions trip, but you look at your bills and think, I can't afford that. And it chokes out the promise when really God had a provision if you just trusted him. God gives you a figure to give in the suddenly offering. And you think, but that's going to take all my savings. And so you don't do it because you let the cares, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of the security of money. Maybe God tells you to take a lower paying job to work with inner city kids. And you, that's your calling. That's your mandate. That's what you feel called to do. But you don't do it. 
because you think, I can't live off the money I make now. There's no way I could take a 25% cut in pay. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. The scenes of destiny in your life get choked. They get strangled. They get suffocated. So he says the first three, and the first one, your so, the, that bad soil, unproductive soil, it gets snatched up. The second one, it gets scorched up. The third one, it gets strangled or choked. And then in verse 23, he says, but there's some good soil. How many of you are glad for good soil? And he says, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, many translations say 30 times, but the old King James says 30, 60, 100 fold. Folding is, a, is, is if you, it, it was an old King James term where you would take a napkin and fold it, then you'd take it again and fold it, take it again and fold it. So if you have a, a napkin, fold it, now one becomes two. And you fold it again, it become, has four edges. Fold it again, four has eight edges. Fold it again, it has 16. It's a doubling effect. So watch this. Even within the productive soil, there's different levels of harvest or productivity. 30-fold, how many of you would like to have $1 and then double it 30 times? Nobody? Have you ever done math in third grade? Hello? How many of you'd like to have, some of you are saying, I wasn't raising my hand because I'm holding out for more. How many of you'd like to have it doubled 60 times? That's a big number. You double $1 60 times, and you got a big number. But you know when you get to 100, how many of you like 100, 100 doubles? Take a dollar, double it 100 times. Do you know you don't have a calculator to figure that? It's such a big number, you, it's, 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 it's inconceivable. So he's saying here, and the Passion Translation says, he'll give you a harvest beyond your wildest dreams. The point is this, it's not just a hundred times what you sowed. He's saying this, it is, it is a, a hundred doubles. It's, 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 it's inconceivable. It's beyond what your mind can imagine. Do you know that God, one promise from God can produce something so great in your life that you can't even calculate the blessings that he's going to put? That's one promise, and the Bible is filled with thousands of promises. So I've come to tell you, when your heart is right, baby, God can do something so big in you that you can't even count it. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good news. Then after this, he goes right into two other parables. So he finishes this parable, and he goes, he tells two other parables, and and. Well, sorry, let me, he goes straight from this parable into another parable about seeds. Then after that parable, he goes into two other parables, and he explains the first parable. Let me say that again. So he finishes this parable about the soil and the seed. He goes straight into a new parable about seeds, but it's different context. Then he tells two other parables. Then he takes the crowd and sends them home, and he goes back to his house. And when he gets back to his house, he says, they said, tell us about that second parable. And he said, okay, I'll explain it to you. So in the second parable, he talks about seeds again. But this time he mixes his up, mixes it up. He said, there was a, there was a guy, and a farmer, and, and he, sowed, he sowed some good seed into a field. And, and he went and slept. While he was sleeping, the, an enemy came and sowed weeds among his seed, good seed, or tares among wheat, some translations say. And so he says, when he comes back out, the servants come and say, Master, look, the weeds are growing with the wheat. The wheat and tares are growing together. Should we pluck the weeds? He said, no, don't do that. Because if you pluck the weeds, you might get the good seeds. So leave it, and at harvest time, we'll, separate, we'll sort it all out. So he tells these other two stories, and, 
and 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 then he he goes back to the house and the disciples say, Jesus, what is the deal with the wheat and tares? You told us about the first one. Tell us the second one. And watch what Jesus does. So he answers them in verse 37. He says to them, he who sows the, the good seed is the son of man, verse 38. And the field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Now, there are keys to, to understanding all of this parable in the definitions of what each thing represents. And, and, and parables have layers, so you can, you can completely not understand it. You can understand part of it. You can understand a deeper meaning, or there can be different applications to the same parable. Now, this parable ends up in some eschatological implications. It ends up in, in the end of the age and stuff like that. For our purposes, that's not what we're doing today. I just want to show you something and bring it home to how it ties into us. So, the sower is the Son of Man or Jesus. And then the field is the world. And then the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. That's what Jesus said, right? Right? Okay. Now leave that up there for a minute. Watch this. In the first parable, the sower was, the, was God. So in both parables, God's the sower. But in this one, specifically Jesus. And there's a reason for that. I'll come to it in a minute. In the first parable, the soil was what? Your heart. Everybody say your heart. In this parable, the soil or the field is what? The world. In the first parable, the seeds were the word of God, right? In this one, the seeds are the sons of of the kingdom of God. Now, who's that? It's you. Anybody that's born again. And then he goes on and says, the guy trying to sabotage it is the devil, and the reapers are the angels, and the bad scenes are the sons of darkness. So, people not born again. So, but watch this. Here's my point, and I'm about to close. In this one, he's talking about your inner world. God sows a seed of his word in your heart, you keep your heart right, you produce a harvest in your life. Over here, Jesus sows you as a seed into the world, and you bear a harvest. This is talking about your inner world, this is talking about your outer world. So he's saying, once you get your inner world right, Lord, help me do this. Then you not only get a word from God, you become a word from God. You don't just get a seed of God's word. You become the seed of God's word. You don't just get a promise from the Father. You are a promise from the Father. Do you know that Jesus was the word, big W. You are a word, little W. Jesus was the seed sown into the earth. You are a seed sown into the earth. Do you understand today, I've come to tell somebody something, that God, once you get your inner world straightened out, God is going to sow you as a seed into your environment, into the workplace, into your school, into your family, into your generation, into your nation, and you are going to bear fruit because you are a word sent by God. You're a good seed that's going to change the world. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. He said you're a good seed. Some of you think I'm a bad egg. I'm a bad seed. I come from bad stock. That's not, put, don't take that down. Put that back up there. Don't, leave that up here. Just leave it up here until we're done. I want this to soak in. They're doing what they think they're supposed to do, but I'm changing the course here. Listen. Listen, watch this. 
You think you're a bad seed because the devil has been lying to you in your inner world about how bad you are. But you don't understand. God said you're a good seed. So, and watch this, watch this. Some of you have been complaining about your environment. But you don't understand is God sowed you as a seed to change it. See, over here, is everybody still with me? I, 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 I've got like a minute, so stay with me. Over here, inside, the soil can't change the seed. Some of you say, but I thought some of it didn't produce it can change the harvest, but it can't change the seed. Because, because God's word can't change even if you are hard-hearted, Hannah. I don't care if you got a rocky heart. I don't care if you got a stony heart. I don't care if you got whatever kind of heart, you got a bad heart. You may reject the seed, but the seed doesn't change its kind based on the soil. When you come over here, this soil can't change the seed either. So if you're an apple seed, it don't matter the soil God planted you in. You're going to bear apple fruit because you are after the nature of the Son of Man, Jesus, the sower who sowed you as a seed. And as a son of the kingdom, you have the nature of the kingdom because you let the kingdom do a work on the inside of you. Now you've been planted into the world. And wherever you go, that environment, listen, the water can't tell the fish what it is and the soil can't tell a seed what to become. So it does not matter where you're planted. If God planted you there, that environment cannot change who God called you to be. You may have been born in a trap house, conceived in the back seat of a car, and abused all your life. But God has a seed he's going to deposit on the inside of you. And when that bears fruit, he's going to take you and sow you as a seed into the world. And all of your brokenness will become a promise of fruit to the earth. My God. Some of you have been saying, but I don't like my environment. I don't like where I'm planted. And I feel pressed. I feel squeezed. Well, of course you do. Because the soil is designed to squeeze the seed. If I had a bag of seeds in my hand, if I just scatter them here, they ain't going to do nothing. See, here, if my heart's right, you throw it into that soil, and it squeezes the potential of God. And on the inside, I'm changed. Once I become a seed, God sows me into an environment, into a church, into a family, into a community, into a generation. See, you thought it was an accident you weren't born. You thought you were a mistake. You've been begging God, I need relief because the soil it's crushing me. And what you don't understand is that soil that the enemy is using to try to crush you is the very soil God is going to use to produce fruit in your life. And he's going to get out of you what he put in you. 
And it's going to expose the glory of God that's on the inside of you. So listen, instead of asking to change environments, start letting your inner world get changed so that you understand, I am born for this. I was planted here by God to change the world. And God has changed my inner world. And now I can change my outer world. Pressing is producing a harvest. That very thing that you're asking for deliverance from might be the very thing that you're called to change.